One example of standing alone was young David, probably a teenager, when uh, everybody else was running in fear from such a person as Goliath. And uh, reading about at least the legends of giants, um, not only giants, but um, people with unusual powers of leadership. Uh, many of these were claimed to be uh, sons of women and spirit beings. Uh, Merlin was one of these and uh, so on in the stories. Um, but many of these giants, many of these powerful people became kings and leaders. And you can imagine the, leading the army, the opposite army says, wait a minute, who's this guy? But um, not so Goliath. I'm getting, I'm just kind of think that maybe he wasn't quite all there. I think he was, uh, hey, what are you doing? You know, that kind of a guy. When uh, David comes up to him, his, his brilliant words are, what have you done, sent a dog after me? Or what do you think I am, a dog? You're going to hit me with your stick? <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't very clever. Uh, they just sent him out to scare everybody. But, and he did that very well because he was a scary guy. But David stood alone. We're going to be looking at some people just to get that idea, but I'm going to ask you how, uh, how do you plan to stand alone for truth? Stand alone for God's truth. Well, let's ask, what does it mean to stand alone? Well, here's my way of saying it. Standing alone for God means to maintain your stand, keep on standing for righteousness, for God's righteousness, even if no one else seems to be doing so. Song, uh, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. No, what's the one? Uh, uh, though no one, no, uh, no one go with me, yet I will follow. I have decided to follow, I have decided to follow Jesus. That's it. Though none go with me, yet I will follow. And that's that's the thing. Are you a believer? Do you believe that what you're believing is correct? Do you believe that God has said to you what what you find in the Bible? Do you believe that He is not? probably correct. He's not usually correct. He's always correct. And that the plan that he has for you is a better way of life. Then you'll be ready to stand alone if called upon. And I would say to you, it is likely that sometime during your life, God will challenge you to stand alone that friends, perhaps family, will say, well, you're just, you're just taking this too far. Um, you'll find yourself in a situation that demands you decide to obey God or compromise to follow the crowd. Well, I just, I just want to dress in this immodest way so that I fit in. I'm going to laugh at those jokes so I can fit in. See. But here's what we need to understand, and that is your decision will either glorify God or give the enemies of God an opportunity to scorn Him. They urge you to turn against God, and you do, and they say, ha, I knew you were nothing. See? I knew your faith was nothing. The prophet Nathan revealed the extent of David's sin with Bathsheba and with her husband Uriah, David's close friend. 2 Samuel 12, 14a, Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. 
could he say that to you, see? Or would you be willing to stand alone? This David that once stood alone finally just gave in to do what other people were doing. Now, your circumstances may involve something as seemingly insignificant as refusing to let your child participate in a school activity, or they may involve a situation that would demand great sacrifice on your part, such as the loss of a job or even your life. I read of a man who was working at a publishing company and been there for many, many years. He wasn't, uh, uh, hadn't been there long enough to, to retire and get benefits, but he found out that they had voted and were now publishing a pornographic magazine. And he wrote to them and he said, if, if that is the decision, I have to leave. They said, goodbye. And so he lost his job. <clears throat> that was not an insignificant thing for him, you see. Let me share with you some examples of standing alone. Daniel provides us with an outstanding example of standing alone. By the way, this was at a time of the uh, Babylonian captivity. This was a time when God was judging his nation, Israel, for their lack of attention to him. Uh, we are in a day when God is punishing America for their lack of attention to him, the turning away of him. And it's during that time that the people are agreed that they're not going to listen to God. And if you take a stand, they will turn against you. When faced with the demand to forsake his prayer relationship with the Lord under penalty of death, he chose to stand alone. You remember this was engineered by the people who worked with him. They found out that the king was thinking about putting Daniel as the, the, the first leader under him. And they said, this guy is not even one of us. He's one of those Hebrews brought in as a slave. And look what he's doing. So they, tr they, they sent out their private investigators. All the gumshoes were out looking around, finding out what what he did, and what he did in secret, and who he met. And he makes, actually, he's very good at his job. He does everything right. They said, okay, there's only one thing we can do, and that is we have to get him for his religion because he's unswavering in that. And so with flattery, they came to the king and say, people need to understand how great you are, great king, Darius, um, so let's issue a proclamation that for a month, nobody can ask anything of God or man except for you. And while his head was so swelled up, he said, okay. So he wrote it down. They made sure that it was of the, the type of law that couldn't be changed by the king himself. The king made the law that he couldn't change. And then when he realized it, he said, what a fool I've been, I'm losing my best man. But Daniel was willing to forfeit his life rather than abandon his convictions. His prayer life was not accidental. Daniel was probably in his 80s by this time, an age that uh, the people all around him never reached. They, were, they lived to about age 40 or 50. <clears throat> so he was you know, twice as old, perhaps, as, as most people. And, um, but he was willing uh, to, he, he said, my life is based upon my connection to God. And no law made in such a frivolous way, made in any way, will stop me from speaking to my God three times a day. Now, God saved Daniel from harm in the lion's den, but he did not know that that would be the result. He was obeying before 
God had, had said, now don't worry, I'm going to put you in with some cozy kittens here after a while and nobody's going to hurt you. He just stood alone. He was willing to do it. So as a result of his willingness to stand alone, God received praise and honor. After Darius witnessed the mighty power of God to protect Daniel, I, I think it's nearly funny that King Darius himself comes to the lion's den. Must have been some pit they opened up. And he says, oh, Daniel, how strong was your God? I'm fine. Lions are fine. Everybody's doing well. Uh, lowers him down, lowers down the thing, brings him back up. Uh, of course, then he tested the lions with those princes that had flattered him before, dropped them in. They were so hungry that it says they tore them apart before they reached the floor. And he wrote something, Daniel 6, 26 and 27. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom <clears throat> that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Wild animals that cannot be controlled. God just did it. So Daniel made the choice to stand alone for righteousness even when it looked as if he would be destroyed. But God not only rescued Daniel from destruction, he prospered him. We find later that God sends an angel to answer some questions that Daniel had. So Daniel's life brought glory to God. The scripture describes him Daniel, as the angel says to him, that he was a man greatly beloved by God, and he was a man who had an excellent spirit. In every generation, God is looking for Daniels, not trying to be spectacular, not leaping off the edge of the temple to see if angels will catch them before they fall. Just people who are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Men and women who understand the truths of Scripture, who purpose to uphold those principles and to obey them no matter what the cost. So the goal in this is not to be a hero. The goal is to be courageous through confidence in God and his truth. Standing alone requires courage. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather a decision based on confidence in something or someone, and that confidence is greater than the emotion of fear. You see, it's it's doing what needs to be done in spite of things being scary. That's what bravery is. That's what courage is. So to stand alone, one must have confidence that obedience to God and his law results in a superior way of life. That your life will be poorer if you disobey. Other lives will be poorer if you, if you show them that you compromise. Even a child can stand alone for truth if he has this confidence in the Lord and his word, which brings me to our opening picture, David. He stood alone, both literally and figuratively, when he faced Goliath, even though he was very young, by most people's Calculation, he was a teenager. He had confidence in 
God. Listen to what he says to Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 45, 46. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, which he had another man hold. Had to be a big shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. This is capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah. This is Jehovah of hosts. Of hosts means the, the host of heaven, which can mean the stars. It's used of that, but it also means the army of the angels. The God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David heard his words. He heard him defying the God of Israel by making fun of the armies of Israel. This day, notice how calmly this is said, see. This day will the Lord deliver thee, and I thought it was interesting, the King James margin tells us the Hebrew is, well, shut thee up. <laughs> you and your big mouth, big fat mouth, God's going to shut you up. Deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. The animals will be feasting on your dead bodies, that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. Well, this is standing alone. And this is standing powerfully in confidence. Daniel's companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stood alone in the fiery furnace when they refused to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's idol, which was representing of him. So this was a test of patriotic loyalty. And they said, well, we live in this land, but we're not of this land, and our king is, is, is the Lord of, of glory. They were fearless. Why? Because they were confident in God. It's not often recognized that they also did not know they were going to be saved. But if you listen to their words, Daniel 3, 17 and 18, Nebuchadnezzar had said, and what God is there that will deliver you out of a fiery furnace? Their answer was, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. That's confidence, isn't it? He can do whatever he wants. Catherine was saying today, I read in the Bible that nothing is impossible with him. He is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king, one way or the other, we will either die and be out of your reach, or he will save us and we'll be out of your reach. But if not, if he does not deliver us, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Period. We will not do it, even if we die. Their story illustrates the fact that though we may feel like we're standing alone, we are never actually alone. Our God is always with us, even in the midst of a fiery furnace. I love the fact that it burned the ropes that bound them. More than one occasion, I've counseled people that have gone through great trials, and I said, now on this side of that fiery trial, you realize that what has changed the most is what was binding you has gone away. You are freer now than you were before. So, God gave his witness in the midst of the furnace with these men. Here's Daniel 3, 24, 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, wait a minute, did, we, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the Lord, True, O king, 
And she said, Lo, I see four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. In the Aramaic, his language, he said, like a son of, of the gods. This is a Elohim, a plural word. And I think he would have meant it as plural. Looks like a son of the gods. But he recognized he was not a normal human being. He was somebody sent from above. By standing alone, they brought glory to God. And again, in the face of this miraculous deliverance, Nebuchadnezzar responded with praise to God. He says, I was trying to teach them a lesson. Their God taught me a lesson. Daniel 3.28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel. Here they must have counseled him a little bit. But you don't know who that is, but that's not another God. It's not one of the sons of the gods. This was an angel. And delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. His word was, I'll throw them in the furnace and they will die. But they wouldn't die. They couldn't die. Changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. But I've learned an important lesson. So, let me give you just a few thoughts on this. Number one, be willing to suffer rejection or even persecution. We know that everyone who stands alone for truth does not receive miraculous intervention. We can't expect that. It might happen, but we can't expect that. Some willingly accepted death rather than worship a false god. And, and these three young men were like that. They said, this may kill us. Doesn't matter. We're not going to do wrong. So you must count the cost when you choose to stand alone. Hebrews 11 gives an account of many heroes of faith who stood alone. And although many of them experienced miraculous deliverance, many others suffered. Here's the last part of the list, Hebrews 11, 36 to 38. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, and moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were put in like a hollow log. And then they actually sawed that log in half while they were in it. Were tempted, meaning tried. They were slain with the sword. This is one word meaning they were, they were sword murdered. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. But then he adds, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These heroic, God-fearing people became cavemen because they were cast out from society. So when you choose to obey God, regardless of the cost, the cost can be very great. And this is what we weigh in our thinking when we are ready to stand alone for God and for his truth. So we must turn to God for the grace and for the strength to face whatever may come. Here's some people that did that. Psalm 45, 4, verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Do what's right. See, Make the proper sacrifices. Psalm 16.1 Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. These are the words of people that are standing alone. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 11. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. The opposite of fear is faith. Faith banishes fear. Faith in a loving God. Love banishes fear, you see. And then verse 11, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Jesus said, 
don't fear what man can do with you. Just fear what God could do with you if you don't turn to him. Eternal death. The world hates this. I saw a billboard on the way to the uh, nursing home. And it said, hell is real. And then they crossed out real and it says, ridiculous. <laughs> Some angry person. Stop telling me about hell. I don't want to hear about it. Okay, we'll stop telling you and then you'll find out. So be willing to suffer rejection or persecution. Could be real, could be avoided uh, by God's miracle, but you can't count on that. Second, use God's armor to do battle against evil. God's armor, spiritual armor, Ephesians 6. To stand alone, you must know the truth revealed in God's word. Truth is the believer's most powerful weapon against evil. Ephesians 6, 14a to 17b, which he's describing the various articles of, of, um, of the armor. The first one is the belt. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, that which is true. And then 17b, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So there is the truth that comes from the Word of God, then there's the Word of God itself. And these are our weapons. When Satan, the belt, the truth, was the thing that the sword hung on. You had access to the word of God by your belief in the truth. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, how did Christ defeat him? What, what, what did he use against the devil? He defeated Satan by quoting truth from the scriptures. Jesus did that. In his response to the devil's first temptation, Jesus emphasized the necessity of knowing God's word, pointing out that our need for God's word is just as critical as our need for physical sustenance. Here's what he said, Matthew 4, 4. But he answered the devil and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He sees the Bible, that's what he's talking about. Even then, in his day, all the Old Testament scripture was being spoken by the mouth of God. He said, I'm going to listen to God. So we must know the truth before we can stand alone for the truth. So I don't think I would ever ask you to stand alone for Open Door Baptist Church. This this assembly may come and go, you see. But for God's truth, please stand, even if your life depends on it. The third is to prepare your heart before God. The, uh, the scary things we face, you better have a heart that's right with God. You don't want to get into this and be reminded that God's going to have to spank you for things you've done you haven't, you haven't made right yet. When given the opportunity to stand alone for Christ's sake, God will provide you with the courage and the wisdom you need. The Lord guides you daily in the paths of righteousness. According to Psalm 23, 23rd Psalm, verse 3, I remember my, my mother was saying, it's in Psalm 23. She looks at me and says, oh, that's the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> you say it a different way you forgot what it was he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness day by day walking the path but he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake so let the Lord transform your life by renewing your mind not with some new philosophy of man but with the word of God by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, put to the test, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. Apply God's truth to every aspect of your life and obey the promptings of his Holy Spirit. 
this isn't where you just hear a voice and say, turn left and do this. Uh, God brings up to your thinking a verse. You may not rem remember where that verse came from, but you remember God saying to your heart these verses. And uh, it, is, it is God the Holy Spirit that brings these things to your mind. Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Let your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Directing it by acknowledging him. <clears throat> Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So I can walk, watch, uh, see clearly where I need to walk. I can avoid the pitfalls. Romans 8, 13. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's the path of pits and snares, snares and thorns. But if you through the spirit do mortify, make dead, the deeds of the body, you shall live. This is to make dead, to, to deadify, to uh, put your leg to sleep so you can't use it, you know. This is what you do with the, the sins of the flesh. The fourth thing is this. Walk not in your strength. Not you all puffed up saying, I'm going to do this. Walk in the strength of the Lord. Identify with Christ's new resurrection life. Read through Romans 6 and notice that since the gospel is the death and resurrection of Christ, what does that have to do with our salvation? Well, his death means that we pay a death, but his resurrection means that he infuses us with a new way of life. He was not raised back to the same body he had. He was raised back to a glorified body. Sin never bothered him again. Death never threatened him again. And we have the power of a regenerated life because his resurrection works in us. Remember that God, Jesus promised, Matthew 5, 10 to 12, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're not so concerned about this kingdom as you are the kingdom of heaven. And you're already enrolled in the kingdom, the Bible tells us, as Christians. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, lying, for my sake. They're just trying to make you look bad so that I look bad. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For persecution? Yes. For great is your reward in heaven. That's an eternal reward. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I said at the beginning, a lot of these things happened when Israel was under the judgment of God. And as the United States is under the judgment of God, it may be that uh, they'll gather together against us. And so they did the prophets before us. Um, Olivia, you get to heaven and Jesus said, I want you to stand over there with the prophets because you suffered like they did. <laughs> Me? <laughs> Number five, love the Lord with all your heart. Loving service to the Lord with all your heart. The idea of standing alone means that you become more concerned about bringing him honor than you are concerned about pleasing yourself. That'll just be too tough. For who? Well, for me. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. To love him and disobey him is a contradiction. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, 
and will manifest myself unto him. You say, well, God doesn't seem real to me. It may be because you're not obeying what he said you should do. He becomes real to you when you have confidence in him over what's going on in the world. Number six, realize that you are never alone. You seem to be standing alone. God, I stand for you. I'm the only one. No, I have, what, 2,000, was it? Thousands, anyway, that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. But God himself will never forsake you. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, end of the age, literally here. Amen. He says, that's the truth. The last part of Hebrews 13, 5, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In the Greek grammar, one of these is in the indicative and the other is in the subjunctive. May not be a glorious hallelujah for you, but uh, indicative is, is that when things are spoken as fact and subjunctive is when it's spoken as possibilities. And he says, in fact, I will never leave thee. And there's not a possibility that I will forsake you. So when you face persecution, God will provide the grace you need. My wife and I have noticed through the years that when the trial was upon us, it didn't seem all that bad to us. I mean, like, not like what we thought. And it was because God was giving us the grace. People said, how, how could you do that? How, how can you be so steadfast? Well, we have the grace of God. People look at you and say, I don't see how you could do that. You say, well, that's because God didn't give you the grace for it. God will provide the grace you need. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul changed his mind about wanting to get rid of that thorn in the flesh. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Number seven, walk humbly before God and man. Standing alone for God is not the uh, actions of the proud. Walk humbly before God and man. James 4, 6, and 10. But he giveth more grace, which is what we need. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Who's, who is chief of the proud? They are. This is focused on me. Look at me. God resists that. But when it's all, look to him not to me. Then he gives grace to the humble and they can endure. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The many preachers, many Baptist preachers that were sentenced to die by burning, I can hardly imagine the worst way to die. And some of them sang to God until the fire and smoke choked them out. One man under torture and persecution had signed a document that said, I reject Christ. So they gave him some nursing and he revived and he said, I recant my recantation. I take back what I said. They said, I put him into the stake. And he said, when they were tying him up, he said, would you please leave this hand out that it will burn first, the one that denied my Lord. He actually held it in the fire until it fell off. How could they possibly stand true to God while being burned? God lifts you up. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, as opposed to the elder, you see, 
submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You be lowly before God, and he will make you great. The eighth thing is this, hate evil. You know why God gave us the ability to hate? <laughs> We're not to hate people, even our enemies. We're to love them. So why do we even have hate? Because we are to hate sin, we are to hate evil, we are to hate it in ourselves, and we are to hate it in others because it's tearing them apart. Never yield to the temptation to secretly desire what you're saying you condemn as evil in others. They shouldn't be doing that, though it does sound fun. Don't give in to that. Psalm 97, 10. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And he gives examples of evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. I think this is God speaking. Romans 2, 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another... Thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. As we take a stand for God's truth, whatever the cost, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's really what we're praying in the Lord's Prayer, how we were taught. So I have a question. Are you willing to stand alone for Christ's sake. Nobody supporting you. My wife had a dream when we were in uh, high school. Seems like. We were what is it? We were dating. And we were dating. And uh, I don't put much stock in dreams, but this was her dream. I had to listen to it. And. Uh, in that day and age, we were still worrying about the communists taking over. We didn't know everybody was giving all their information through TikTok to China. <clears throat> Gary and Pat are always on TikTok. It's just one of those weird things. He says, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, in the dream, the communists had taken over. And they were visited the people of our church. One by one, the men who stood leaders of our church met with the communists and they agreed to deny Jesus and live. And she couldn't believe that all these men that she had respected so much and that had been such leaders in her life were all capitulating before the communists, before the threat of death. And then she looked at me and she said, the last thing I heard was that they were going over to visit you, going over to your house. She saw my question, well, what happened? She said, I don't know, I woke up. <laughs> oh, great, now I had to finish the dream. And I think it was a strengthening thing because I came to the place I said I'd, I'd have to stand alone, knowing that everybody else had given up. I would say, but I will not. Do your worst. Put your trust in God. Walk before him with courage and faith. Let's pray. Father, it may be you call us to a time of persecution, maybe a time of death, perhaps even of torture. 
But I ask, Father, that you might help us to recognize that there would be nothing worse we could do than to compromise our trust, our faith, our adherence to your way, your word and your way. I ask that you might give us the steel in our bones, the, the steel in our back bones, the, the strength of heart to say, I will do what I ought to do because it's right, not because it's convenient or because everybody else is doing it. I ask, Father, that you might give us then even wives we were talking about who must say to their husbands, I cannot do what you've asked because you're asking me to commit a wrong. You're asking me to lie. You're asking me to deceive. You're asking me to do something that I can't do. And so I would ask you to change your mind because it will not look good for you. But if you do not change, I will not bow to such a thing. I will stand alone. For children whose parents tell them that they have to do something, or children in, in schools where the teacher, the, the leaders tell them to do something wrong, to read something that's, that's false. They'll say, I cannot do that. I will not obey. Just stand alone. We pray, Father, that you might give us that strength to stand like the prophets did, and if they were persecuted, to, to gain something of the, the prophet's reward as you honor us in heaven. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be you're saying, I, I'm not looking forward to being persecuted and tormented and tortured, burned at the stake, or whatever worse things that they've invented recently. But I will not turn my back on Jesus who died for me. I will not spit on the Bible that has shown me the superior way of life. So I take this as my stand. I will not bow to the things of the world. For I save my bowing to God himself. I'm ready to stand alone for God. Pray for me. If that is your prayer, if that's your dedication, or if you just say, pray for me, slip your hand up, say, pray for me. Yes, 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 yes. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Father, then we turn to thee asking for the grace to deal with whatever problems may come. And as our, our nation turns away from thee, we can expect some gathering group to demand that we accept their way of life and reject your way of life. And we'll have to say, whatever you threaten, we cannot do. For God is greater than you and more important to me. I pray that you might allow us then to be a group of people that will not bend before the world even if we must be broken. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.